Okay, so I'm just going to ask you one question. Uh, what do you know about the land you come from? Oh, see, I told you I wouldn't know what to say. Um, Josie, what do you know about the land you come from? I don't. My name is Josie, and I currently reside on Treaty 6 territory in so-called Edmonton. I grew up feeling very proud and fortunate to have been raised in Canada, such a big, beautiful country. But within the past few years, I have been forced to reconsider my relationship with Canada. I am very fortunate to have been able to grow up in a healthy, happy home. Um, But other Métis girls who are not in my situation face very different circumstances. And quite honestly, if I didn't have my circumstances, I would be in a very different place right now. I do not feel a connection to my traditional land. I do not feel a connection to my ancestors. It's something I'm working towards and I'd really like to have, but it's not really something that was celebrated growing up. It's not something I was taught growing up. Um, The little indigenous culture we had was picking Saskatoons and making Saskatoon pie with my Nana. That was learning how to jig and dancing to the fiddle. Yeah, that's about it. We didn't go to powwows, we didn't smudge, we didn't do any of that. And it wasn't until junior high that I started learning a bit more about my culture because we would have like an indigenous day where there would be um, elders and other people come in who would teach us cool things like how to throat sing and hoop dance and things like that. And I was just so, so, so excited about it. Um, but the weird thing was, was it was only the indigenous students at our school who participated, which I found odd. And then in high school, I started wanting to reconnect a little bit more and understand my culture and my history and where my family comes from and everything. And it was weird because some of my friends or just people were overtly racist towards indigenous people. And so they would say things around me and I would just kind of accept it and move on and say, oh, they're, they're uneducated. Um, but then there's also people who were asking me what percentage Métis I was. What percentage Métis are you? You're essentially white, you're just white. So I've always had this weird relationship with my ethnicity because I'm not indigenous enough, yet I'm not white enough at the same time. I was first introduced to the residential school genocide when I was in grade nine. And there was one page in my school textbook that talked about it. And that was all. That was all I had. And I felt sick to my stomach when I learned about it. And just so in sh- like shocked of how we could just brush over it. like. It wasn't an integral part of our country's history. When you think about it, every single indigenous person you know is either a survivor of residential schools or is the descendant of someone who went to residential school. It's impossible that you're not, um, as I discovered this year. Even before residential schools, um, up until 1985, Women with Indian status who married someone without status, so some like a white man, a colonizer, um, they would lose all their rights. But men, on the other hand, did not lose their Indian status in the same way. Even after Bill C-31 reinstated the status rights of many women in 1985, the act still discriminated against women by privileging male lines of descent, basically 
it's just taking away your whole identity. If you're unfamiliar with the Indian Act, essentially in 1867, the Indian Act defined an Indian as any male person of Indian blood. And the Indian Act, sorry, was put in place from 1867 to 1951. Status Indian women lost their status rights if they married a man who did not have status, as would their children. So it was essentially the government's tactic of just weeding out the indigenous status and basically assimilating so that everybody will essentially be white in the end. With the discovery of the graves at the Indian residential site in Kamloops and then the countless other discoveries after, it brought up some new conversations within my family and with my extended family as well. Um, and I have always thought that I didn't have any relatives or ancestors who had to endure a residential school experience. Um, however, when we were talking about it this past year, um, it did come up that my grandfather on my dad's side, where my Métis blood comes from, um, was actually a residential school survivor. And I didn't know this. Um, my dad said that he knew he went to a school that he didn't have to stay overnight at, but he would go every day. Even though he didn't stay there and wasn't taken away from his family, he still endured a lot of abuse. And that translated later on in his life as um, it turned into alcoholism and he abused substances. And it just made him not a happy person. The trauma that stuck with him stayed forever, even after he married, even after he had children. Sometimes I think about how my uncle told me a story about how his grandfather, so my great-grandfather, who went to the residential school, um, when he would drink too much and he would get drunk, he would just say, I'm just a dirty Indian. I'm just an Indian. And that really, I don't know, that really upset me, I think. Um, just because I think the kind of things they instilled in his mind when he attended the school of how he was worthless, how he was not human, how he was a savage or below, like he wasn't worthy, he wasn't the same as white people and how he had to become a white person and leave the Indian behind and fight the Indian out of the child. That, it just, I don't know. I think that really, it's just really, it's really sad. I don't know. People will see indigenous people in the street and judge them and say, oh, they're just lazy, they have no motivation, they could go and get a job, but they choose not to, um, they're just drug addicts. That is so far from the truth and it makes me so angry because this is not their choice. Like, who would choose to sleep on the sidewalk at night and have no food and have to lose their dignity and beg in the streets. Who would choose that? Nobody would choose that. This is the direct reflection and the direct outcome of residential schools. People who attended residential schools were severely mistreated. They were stripped of their identity the minute they arrived. We call it Orange Shirt Day because there was a woman who is now in her 50s, but back when she was six years old, she was told she was going to a residential school. And she was excited. She didn't realize, obviously, how bad it was. She thought it was school. She was excited for school as a six-year-old. So she went with her mom or her grandmother to find a shirt, find some clothes. 
So they ended up buying a shiny orange shirt with like lace trimming, I think. And she just adored it. She loved it and she was so excited. And right when she walked into the school, they stripped her, took all her clothes, her belongings, they cut her hair, and basically made her one of the clones who stayed in these schools. They all had the same haircut, they all dressed the same in the same uniform. And it was just basically the idea of fully assimilating and yeah, fighting the Indian out of the child. It goes way back with colonialism and the ethnocentrism that Europeans felt towards indigenous people. When they first colonized, they believed they were much smarter and stronger and just more human than indigenous people. And they saw indigenous people essentially as animals. Even though indigenous people literally saved their lives and kept them alive and helped them survive in the harsh conditions. And all they got back was diseases in exchange for all the wisdom and care they provided for the colonizers. Looking at where indigenous people are now, it varies, but a lot of people are dealing with substance abuse, they're dealing with mental health issues, and they're not receiving proper care or help for either. They're forced to deal with it on their own. And because of that, they are unemployed. Because of that, they are forced to live in the street. It's just a cycle. It's a vicious cycle. And it's so obvious. It's right in front of our eyes. And somehow, we can't seem to fix this problem. Because of the intergenerational trauma that all indigenous people experience, they directly hand down their mental illness to their children. It's genetic. So their children become mentally ill. Their children become addicted to substances. And the cycle just continues. Today, September 30th, is Orange Shirt Day. And some people don't know exactly what this day means. Today is a day of remembrance. It can be treated like Remembrance Day. It's a solemn day. It's a day to reflect on the atrocities of the Canadian government and the Catholic Church. It's a day to listen to survivors, reflect on the crimes that were committed by both the government and the church, and remember all the children who didn't make it home. We also want to remember the children who did make it home, but faced mountains of suffering afterwards.